Hi, everyone's yeah. joining. We're just, uh, we'll just wait for people to start filing in. I, I, I don't really have any um, analogies that work virtually yet. So uh, yeah, just we're well, waiting for a few people to just kind of come in and sit down and relax and then we'll get started. So uh, yeah. We'll have some awesome like cold talk. What is it? Small talk is in English. Cold yeah. talk. That was horrible. Yeah. yeah, I accidentally triggered my Alexa to play music just now. Uh, I hope that doesn't I... happen during the talk. That would be... <laughs> I don't know. It depends on what the music is. It could be a nice kind of interlude. That is true. That would that be, is true. Yeah. yeah. Or something yeah. super dramatic at a dramatic point <laughs> in the talk. Hi. Hi, Stina. <laughs> Welcome. The chat is open if people want to say hi. Um, so uh, feel free to use it at any point. Hope everyone is doing well this evening. This is always like the worst thing about virtual meetups, like in a normal yes. meetup everyone talks with each other yeah <laughs> no, yeah like, exactly yeah here we are <laughs> yeah yeah it's kind of uh yeah it's um i find this the whole way uh, i did a webinar recently and again i was just talking to myself for a while yeah. uh, while everyone just kind of filed in i didn't even have anyone that was co-hosting so i was just <laughs> just talking to everyone but yeah. uh, the worst part is when you tell a joke, usually there's like one guy laughing in the back, but now <laughs> yeah. it's just dead silence all the time. No one appreciates this. But you can, yeah. now, you, now you can imagine that everyone is laughing instead. Oh, yeah, I guess. Yeah. <laughs> I'm, uh, I'm getting a bit used to it now that with the amount of kind of uh, online virtual meetups and conferences that we've had as well. I'm kind of getting used to it. Initially, it was quite hard because the, you know, the moderator would tell a joke or something and you'd just be like, was that funny? I don't know, but uh, now I'm getting used to it. It's, it feels less awkward now than it did before. So, yeah. Yeah, I, I watched the like online conference Women of React a few weeks back. Yeah. Uh, and I think like uh, Cassidy Williams was the MC, and she had like recorded herself laughing, so she played that at every joke. <laughs> <laughs> it was perfect. It really, really, really was. Yeah, that's cool. Hi everyone that's kind of coming in. We are just chatting while people come in. So uh, yeah, don't think you're in the wrong place. You were in the right place for the Stockholm JS meetup. Um, and we'll get started in a couple of minutes. Yeah, exactly. So yeah. Everyone joining is Zoom bombing this meeting. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. And the wrong link. Yeah. I expect some sort of llama or something to pop up at some point, but yeah. Okay, I'm going to I'm going to get started and uh, start uh, uh, doing this proper um, and then uh, people can kind of catch up as they as they go. So yeah, we'll, uh, we'll get going. So uh, hi, everyone. Um, thanks uh, so much for joining us. Um, it's, uh, I'm very pleased that so many of you have decided to shun the sunshine outside and watch us instead. Um, although maybe you are outside, we were talking earlier, maybe you are outside in the park listening to this, um, but wherever you are, welcome. It's uh, great to see you. My name's Becky. I'm one of the uh, organizers of Stockholm JS. Um, uh, and when I'm not organizing meetups, I work as a full stack JavaScript developer um, at a company called uh, Hyot Labs. Um, and uh, yeah, tonight we are co-hosting with uh, Acast again. This is the second time we work with Acast and uh, it's been a pleasure both times. And uh, yeah, I'm really glad that they could do this again for us tonight. Um, we've got two great talks tonight. Um, the setup is the same as the last virtual meetup that we had. So uh, you'll listen to the talks and there'll be a question and answer session at the end where I will kind of read the questions that you've kind of uh, uh, written. The Q&A is open, so feel free to kind of write your, your questions all the way through. Uh, it won't disturb anyone. 
Uh, I'll just collate those and I'll ask them at the end. So yeah, feel free to get your questions in whenever you want. Um, and uh, as I said, the chat is also open. So feel free to chat and tell us how you're feeling and say hi and uh, yeah, go from there. So yeah. So without further ado, I will pass it over to Agnesha to talk about, uh, give us a brief introduction to ACAST. Thank you, Becky. Let me show Welcome. my screen. I hope you can see it all right. Yep, perfect. Okay. Uh, hello, everyone. Uh, welcome to ACAST virtually this time. Uh, my name is Agnieszka and I'm a senior software engineer uh, here at ACAST. I work in Team Vision, where we build uh, data products to help creators understand their audience. ACAST is hosting uh, today's meetup, so I would like to introduce it to you first. Um, what do we do? ACAST provides everything podcasters need to create and share their shows everywhere. We strive to facilitate the entire podcast journey from hosting, distributing, and monetizing podcasts to delivering audio and stitching ads. Additionally, we provide great user experience, both in the apps and on the web. ACAS was created in 2014, and it recently celebrated its sixth birthday. Uh, we are a global company with over 230 employees working in offices across the world or remotely. Our tech and product development consists of approximately 60 people. The majority is based in our Stockholm office. What helps us collaborate across these offices is the remote first culture, which is particularly useful in the times like these. So now you know what we do. Let's discuss how we approach uh, software development. Uh, we work in autonomous cross-functional teams, which have a clear goal. Uh, the team has the freedom to decide how we reach it. Um, our teams are responsible for the whole development process, which includes what happened? Uh, which includes uh, not only implementation and testing, but also deployment, monitoring, etc. This is the slide I want to be on. Uh, let's talk about infrastructure. We aim to be cloud agnostic and prefer not to lock ourselves into a specific vendor, but uh, most of our production services run in Docker containers and are managed by Amazon ECS. Uh, we also make a heavy use of serverless solutions like AWS Lambdas. And now time for automation. We strive to automate as much as we can so that we can focus on delivering great features to our users instead of doing manual tasks. Who doesn't like that? Uh, for example, we use bots like Renovate to keep our dependencies up to date. Uh, we automate our deployments using AWS CDK. Um, it is hard to describe engineering at ACAS in just a few minutes. Uh, that's why I would like to encourage you to learn more about it uh, from the Medium article that was posted in April. One thing to note is that JavaScript is heavily used in our tech stack both in the front end and in the back end. Today, you will get the chance to hear about our experiences with monorepos. I'm handing over to you, Daniel. Thank you. All right. Let Thank you, Anishka. Share. Can I steal your screen now? Yes. Great. <laughs> OK, I hope you're seeing what I'm seeing. So. Monorepos, you've probably heard of them. Perhaps you've worked with them. 
perhaps you're using one right now, like at the office or with an open source project or on your own. And uh, when I set out to, or not just I, I was a couple of team members and I uh, set out to look into the mono request for the first time, we did what you know everyone does the first time you look something up on the internet, you, you Google it. And the search result, the, the first one is pretty expected, the Wikipedia article for a monorepo, uh, which gives you, you know, the facts, some info about what is it actually about? What does it do? But it doesn't help me in actually finding out why I should use it or if I should use it. Does it even fit my, like the things I'm using? Uh, so you start scrolling down and you start to look at, like find other sources uh, and uh, other types of information. And it stops on the second search result because the second search result for monorepos is monorepos, please don't. And at that point, you're sort of like, well, that's it then, I guess. I'm heading out. Because this is also the most clapped article on Medium about monorepos, which immediately gives the sense that, yeah, this is probably something that a lot of people dislike. But moving on, you scroll down a bit more, and right after that comes the result, monorepos, please do. And now you're just all confused and you realize that, ah, oh, this is probably something with a lot of differing opinions and no one can actually give me a non-biased view of whether or not I should use it. So what I did is that I ended up in this never ending loop of articles, opinionated articles, fighting against each other, saying that it's, at all, it's either the like, second coming, it's gonna solve all your issues, or it's awful, it takes ages, it ruins your, your ownership and just, just avoid it, please. But of course, all of this is biased, it's opinionated, it has to do with specific experiences from, from, from specific uh, teams with a specific set of, uh, of tools. So with this talk, I thought I'd just save you some of the trouble and give you, share some of the experiences that I've had and the, the, the information I've found uh, together with my team at ACAST. So uh, being the uninventive guy that I am, I decided to call this talk monorepos, please do, don't, don't sort of do what you like. Uh, but just like a short introduction, introduction with, to me. Uh, my name is Daniel Griffberg. I uh, also work at ACAST as a senior software engineer, formally. Informally, I'm a front-end developer who spends way more time on DevOps than I think my product owner actually wants me to. But it's helped me a lot, and I feel like I'm, I know this stuff now, which is good. So this talk will be split into two parts. The first one will be just uh, basically the Wikipedia article all over again, and then some more I want to say non-biased, but I'm probably biased myself. Uh, but some information about what makes a monorepo great, what makes it bad, uh, some example scenarios that we've gone through, uh, and then just a quick recap to see if perhaps it would fit your needs. Uh, following up on that, hopefully, or I guess I'm already biased, maybe some of you wanted to give it a try. So we'll go through some tool recommendations to set up your first project, just some, you know, quick tips uh, and uh, some less obvious things that we found has helped us a lot in setting up our own projects. And then at the end, you know, questions and all that. So first up, what is a monorepo? We're back to Wikipedia again. By its definition, a monorepo is multiple logical projects that are available in one monolithic repository. And I, I think I, ha I highlight it extra here, but please, it's a monolithic repository, not a monolithic application. That's something very different and something much worse, and you want to avoid that stuff. But the monolithic repository has been around for ages, and I'm sure if you've had this discussion at work or with maybe some colleagues who have been around for a long time, everyone will come back to you and be like, oh, we did that in 2002 with 
X project, um, which is true. It's been around for ages, but it has, I'd say, since two, 2017, gotten sort of trendy, or rather it's seen an increase in people using it, mostly inspired by larger tech companies um, uh, embracing it. But I'll, I'll get back to that in a bit. A monorepo does not have to be one thing. It doesn't have to be one repository containing all your stuff uh, with all your apps, all your packages, all your everything. It can also be uh, just one application that, that is divided into multiple uh, modules or packages that are scoped at, as separate projects within the repo. But like I mentioned, we have the, the, the tech companies, the big ones, the major ones, you know, Google, Facebook, Microsoft, Airbnb, Twitter, probably lots of others. And many of them have their own build systems. Uh, this is a really common thing that makes it extra confusing, I'd say, looking into this for the first time. A lot of them are built in a specific way. They're super, they're, they're meant only for that company. Some of them are open sourced and they're like, yeah, here's our stuff, try to build something with it. And it's hard, uh, hard to get around. Uh, it's also very common among open source projects. Uh, since we're here for Stockholm JS, some typical JS ones are React Bubble, uh, definitely typed for TypeScript and NestJS. Um, and these are usually quite different. They're smaller projects. They're not meant for this, these like terabytes of terabytes of code that takes half a year checkout uh, and then just breaks your Git. Uh, but they're more like divided into smaller modules that makes it easier to do like incremental uh, releases or you perhaps only use, you have like the core package and then you have some extra packages strapped on there and you can use some of them and they have different versioning and stuff. Um, but you've definitely encountered this in the wild at some point, I th I'd say, uh, even if you didn't know it. But yeah, so back to the, to the opinions, the bias. The, this is from me trying to pitch this, or not just me, I keep saying me, but remember this is, was a team effort, so I'm just speaking for the, the people at ACUST. Um, but so when we tried this out the first time, or like wanted to, you keep seeing these, or getting these questions back. Here are some, these examples here, like but who owns that? What about build times? It's gonna take ages. I had a friend who worked at Google. He said, please don't, it's bad. Uh, and then you, and you know, who will maintain it? And the classic one, the mono, once again, monolithic application, everyone knows that's bad. Don't do that, go back. And uh, yeah, you need some th something to, to come back with. And you can't just be, can't just be the seller. You can't just say, but we will fix this. It's perfect, it solves everything. No one will believe that. So we started really going to town on this and trying to, we tried it out with different projects and we also, you know, started to really uh, determine what are the actual drawbacks in us doing this and what will it give us. So I want to, going forward, I want to phrase that, like I said, we're, we're JavaScript developers here. Uh, I will try to, I will not go into those other build to systems that I just mentioned. Uh, I will stick to like JavaScript only uh, build tools, specifically Lerna, Yarn, and uh, maybe Narwhal Next, uh, because that's what we're using. And it's also, I think, the easiest, one of the easier ones to, or some of the easier ones to just, you know, dive into and start your own pro project with. Um, so for our setup then, like I said, in our case, we use uh, Lerna mostly, Lerna with Yarn workspaces. Uh, and here are some of the top like pros and cons that we've come up with. I'll start with the, with the pros here. You get them all at the same time because I don't care to click thousands of times here. Top one, dependency management. And this is without a doubt, this is really what usually attracts someone to look into a monorepo, maybe the code refactoring and stuff, but the dependency management is without a doubt the biggest benefit in that you both maintain your uh, your own dependencies next to the, the dependence, the, the applications or packages actually consuming uh, the dependencies or packages you're creating. 
this gives you a lot of tools and like you can link them together. You can make sure that when you update something uh, in one package, it also, uh, you can use it while developing in the dependent and you can make sure, you know, that it gets tested when something changed and all that goes into the point further down, the regression testing one. Uh, and then you have, of course, tied into this, the code reuse. So the code reuse here is really important uh, for the monorepos in that what you would do, or not what you would do, you really shouldn't, but you, you, you tend to do that because it's easy, it's fast. When you have those multiple repos, I'm sure everyone's done that, done it several times. When you have some code, it's not enough to create a new package for, but you want it in that other repo repository as well. So you copy paste it and copy pasting is fine, but with a monorepo, you don't really have to. You can pretty much extract everything into reusable, small, independent modules that you can then use from all your apps uh, or packages. And you just end up with a, you know, a one, more of one source of truth when it comes to those, uh, those uh, functions and the, like the, the, your shared code. Uh, code refactoring is a pretty popular one. I, I do use this a lot, but I'd say it's one of the smaller ones since you can technically combine multiple repos in, in your IDE and search across it. But it's generally quite easy, especially if you're using TypeScript or using you know, type languages of any, can, uh, of any kind, in that you can just base, like I'm changing something three dependencies down and the IDE warns, warns me about something breaking you know, all the way up in the app, three imports uh, down the line. Um, which is great, uh, but it's can't, you can't really trust it, of course, a hundred percent. So it still comes with a, with a lot of, um, with a lot of caveats. And then, like I mentioned for dependency management, regression testing. So regression testing is, is that's not exactly what it is. You can do regression testing anyway, but it helps in the sense that you can ensure that when I change my dependency, my package, everything within the monorepo that depends on that package will also be tested all the time. I won't discover that, you know, a couple of days later when we actually decide to update to that dependency um, and, and the changes have already been committed. And I can make sure that the testing, uh, the, the, the test will pass, it will work even after I've, uh, or sorry, before I've uh, uh, pushed the, the changes, released a new version for the package. And then we have the smaller ones that I find to be quite nice and worth mentioning, uh, but it shouldn't, I would say, say that it shouldn't drive your decision. But a common one is like you have an app, it has a backend and it has a, a front end, the client and server, uh, and you serve the client bundle through the backend and it's all just it might end up with one big project you know, one package JSON file uh, representing both. So you'll have both your front-end dependencies and your back-end dependencies in the same file. Not optimal. With the monorepo, you can still maintain that feeling of having one application with one front-end one, and one back-end, but they can have completely different, like technically be completely different packages, or apps, I keep mixing terms, uh, with different package JSONs, different dependencies and different requirements, build steps, all that jazz. Uh, and it's completely separate, but still works together. Code consistency, of course, comes up a lot in you know, your reviews. You want things to look the same way. When you set up a new project, it has the same scripts, it has the same language, the same style of code. Now, this is definitely not hard to do with uh, multiple repos either, but you can sort of enforce it in a different way and it makes it a lot easier to, to maintain and, you know, link to this line in this completely different project uh, later. Uh, and once you're up and running, it takes some time, but once you're up and running, I would say, at least in our case, it does increase the speed of development. Setting up a new project is quite fast. Uh, and once it's up, both the project, but also the monorepo itself, you can kind of just keep going. There's not that much, uh, you don't need to maintain all those repos at once. Can do sweeping changes across the board. It's quite, quite useful. 
But there are, of course, some drawbacks. With the top one, without a doubt, always comes up is the CI build times. So the CI build times will be increased. It takes longer. It's more stuff to check. But as I've marked in the little, with a little star there, is that, yes, the build times usually increase, or they almost certainly will. But as a whole, it, I would still say it saves you time during your day because you don't have to do any manual changes, like go through different repos and uh, update them one at a time. Uh, second up, the learning curve. There is a learning curve. I'd say it takes some time getting comfortable with it. It's good to have someone kind of driving it and being able to answer questions and who was there and set it up in the first place. Uh, but once you're there, it's quite convenient. But there's certainly a learning curve and you'll have to repeat it every time someone new who's only worked with regular repositories uh, joins your team, for example. Uh, and which brings us to project ownership. When you eventually merge teams, split teams, separate, you, someone owns that project now, you want to take care of the ownership. There are tools to, to cater for this but it is not as good as say you're using GitHub or something and you can just like, oh, these are the owners. Only these have, people have right permissions. Um, it's, not, it's, not, it's not built for that. So out of the box, there's definitely much. So, so if that's something you care about or that your, I don't know, boss cares about, uh, it might be something to consider. Uh, and once again, you have the, the tinier ones. All eggs in one basket is one thing that comes up quite a lot, which is true. If someone were to get, uh, you know, access to your monorepo without, you know, someone that shouldn't have access to it, you're in a pretty bad spot. They have all your source code now. Not great. Or like, I don't know, accidentally deleting it. Please don't let that happen. Uh, but it's also, it, that shouldn't happen in the first place. Slow Git interactions is something that, comes up a lot when you search for it, but that, that tends to happen, you know, when you're at a point with a really large repo, uh, and then you start to really need other, at that point, when you're that, your repo is that big, you probably start, need to start, you know, doing more, having a dedicated DevOps team to, to carry it because your, your repo is already huge. Uh, and for the same reason as the project ownership, per project security and auditing, with auditing I mean like commit history and stuff like that, uh, and security is the access part, it is harder to, to set up and it's, if that's a priority, it's probably not for you. Okay. Uh, so in trying to, when we came up with these, or came up, when we, we researched these pros and cons, uh, we said, what are some examples uh, where we struggle at them? Or like, maybe not struggle, but like where we avoid creating another repository or another service because it's annoying. Uh, you know, the copy paste situation I mentioned, or when you find yourself wasting a lot of time um, jumping between repos and you wish, you, you think a monorepo might be better. One of those is when you have that crucial security update, you know, you get the, the mail from GitHub saying, oh, this thing is super dangerous now, please remove it. So you go to, actually, let's step through this. You, you go to your uh, apps that all use this dependency and you update them one at a time. Maybe you do a search and replace. It's pretty effective. It doesn't take much time. So you update all of them, let's say four apps in this case. And then you push that one at a time for each repo. Uh, maybe you have a review, review process, we do. So you have to wait for those PRs to be approved by someone. Uh, maybe you just don't care, so you force merge it, like the admin you are. So you merge all of them. Could be quite fast, could take a lot of time, depending on your processes, but it's still a lot of steps to go through. With a setup like what we eventually uh, went with and what we have uh, today with Lerna, this whole flow would be the same as doing this. So Lerna exec, this is a, a Lerna command. Uh, if you don't, if you're not following, just don't, bother, don't worry about it. 
uh, LearnExec basically runs this command in all of the matching um, matching packages or projects throughout your monorepo. So in this case, we would upgrade that dependency. So every uh, project that has that dependency would upgrade it. We would merge that and wait for the PR to, to be approved. And remember, in this case, we've, we're, we're pushing all of it at the same time. We're upgrading it throughout all these apps. And then as it's approved, we merge the PR and hopefully we have a correct enough pipeline that will make sure to version these correctly uh, and in the right order, which Learna will do for you, uh, and then publish them with the crucial security update fixed. So there's a lot of steps. I, like I said, this is, it looks more than it is, but there are definitely steps that you can, you, you, you can skip when you have this setup. And you should remember, like I, I'm showing, I'm pointing at my screen, like someone sees what I'm doing, but yeah. Uh, even if I keep adding more apps to this, so you would start with app one, two, three, four, five, six, you would increase the step for each of these, uh, the update, the wait for PR and the merge. But with the monorepo setup, with Learner in this case, it's always just three steps uh, because you can merge it all at the same time. Next example, code reuse. We want to share the same lines of code for specific task in each of our apps. First up, one example. You update the code in one app, you take that code, or maybe you have that code already, so you copy the code into the next app and into the next app. Uh, and then change it, you know, maybe it's something has to be converted to as follow a specific convention, or in this case, you know, be in TypeScript instead of regular JavaScript. And we're back. We wait for the PR approvals. We merge the stuff. But we know maybe we shouldn't be copy pasting this. This is a good thing to extract. It should be its own package. So we make a separate repo for it. Uh, so we have all our app repos and we have that common package in its own repo now. So we update the code in the common package. We wait for the PR to be approved in that one only because we have to do that first since that needs to be published before it can be used by the others. Mind you, we can still link, you know, NPM or yarn link while doing this to sort of emulate uh, the, the monorepo environment. But we can't, if for, when we, it comes to the actual like publishing the versions, the common package needs to be published first. And then we go to our other apps. We update the dependencies there in each of them. We wait for the PR approval and we merge the stuff. So now we're at more, even more steps. It's a better solution, I'd say, but it takes even longer than before. While if we're, we were to do this very exact thing, thing in our monorepo, it would once again be the same amount of steps. We update the code in the common package, that gets, you know, prop, or I, I'm a bit, I, we could, I could add a step here saying that we replace the initial code in the apps first. Uh, and then we wait for the PR to be approved and then we merge the PR. So it, it's, it scales in that sense. Uh, but then you, there are other ways to argue that, it, that you know, complications with scaling uh, when it comes, at, at, at a certain point, it will start taking a lot of time and stuff. But when it comes to actually maintaining multiple apps with shared dependencies at once, there are some clear benefits, I'd say, uh, compared to uh, the, the previous many repo style that we used. Um, so, should you use a monorepo? I can't answer this for you, and I shouldn't, I, I'm already quite biased. I've, I've only shown you two examples where monorepos are good. I didn't show you anyone where monorepos are much worse because I probably could come up with one, but it wouldn't. I, I, I tried to give some examples that we've run into, uh, and this is, that, that was sufficient for this, uh, for this presentation. But what you can do is to go through, you know, what you're, learn, what, what you're learning here, but also read online and, and answer some of these questions. Because uh, I feel like if you identify with, I said two or more here, but practically any of them, 
uh, or feel really strongly about one of them, I say try it out. It maybe don't, you know, put all your stuff, your whole company's uh, code base into one monorepo and think that, oh, it didn't work. Uh, maybe try, try with a couple at first. Like what at Acast we do team-based monorepos rather than one huge monorepo. Uh, since we don't really have the time to maintain that, we don't have the knowledge uh, within the company necessarily. And we want to still have that team ownership for our, and it, there's usually more overlap, a lot of more stuff that makes sense to share in separate packages uh, within the team rather than within, uh, say, the whole organization. And it solves a lot of the issues that I mentioned about, you know, project ownership or package, who should have access to what or things like that. Uh, may I, can, I guess I can go through them real quick. So it, I maintain two or more packages that depend on each other. So this is the situation that I mentioned. You have the uh, dependencies relying on each other. You can update them all at once uh, and it's quite quick. Second one, I like to split my project into smaller modules and packages. Yeah, if you do that, great. You're already halfway for a monorepo because it makes it a lot easier. Uh, I maintain projects that have both a front end and a back end. Going back to what I mentioned on the pros and cons slides about the separating your front end and back end projects instead of keeping them as one. Uh, I have a person on my team who can set this all, oh, okay, that's something I added, trying to be funny, but I forgot to remove it, ha. Huh. Uh, I value consistency across my projects. Once again, pretty important one, if uh, you care about this and if it's something you find yourself nitpicking in reviews and stuff, makes it a lot easier. And lastly, I find myself copy pasting a lot of code between projects, like the example I showed you before this slide. It can save a lot of time while still being a better solution uh, than having to maintain different copy pasted code snippets. You can just maintain it in that one shared package while still it still feels during development as if it's part of that same project. Okay, so that's sort of a run through of the first part of this, just catching you up on why the, the what and maybe why of using monorepos. So I'm thinking for the second part here, if we can change the slide, yeah. This second part will be, I won't do live coding because if there's one thing I've learned is that it ends in disaster always. So I will be giving recommendations, uh, some tools and basically a summary of what I feel if, if I were to, what, what I wish I knew, knew back then and if I were to start a fresh project right now in a small to mid-sized team with like with say up to, I don't know, arbitrary number 20, 30 pro projects uh, in one, that's, that's a lot actually, say 20, um, then this is what I would do. Okay, so we start with the tool recommendations and I've already kind of mentioned it to you with the core like the, the foundation for our JavaScript combined monorepo. We have some apps, we have some packages. So we start with Lerna. Lerna is definitely the most important part here in that Lerna can do everything if you, in, in that, we're, that we want here, uh, not actually anything. So Lerna is the tool that you use to uh, sort of, it has the monorepo commands. You can do uh, your, um, the versioning that it will make sure to only publish packages or projects that have been changed. You can make it can link the dependencies for you. It can do a lot of things that you need to to run your uh, monorepo smoothly. Second up, which is also a good contender for uh, monorepo on its own, is Yarn Workspaces. It's more about dependency management. You probably used Yarn, uh, or, or most of you at least, uh, at some point. But with the workspace uh, feature, you can pretty much set, uh, set up a, a, a monorepo in the same way you do with Lerna. It just doesn't give you the same types of tools when it comes to like filtering out uh, specific projects for certain actions or only running changed 
things, the projects that have changed and all that. So with this combined, when you have Yarn with its better, I'd say better uh, dependency management uh, capabilities, especially like dependency hoisting and stuff like that, uh, and Lerna that has all the commands for you, we found that the best solution in this case is to simply merge, like use both. So Lerna will take care of publishing, versioning, like the monorepo filter command, like the exec stuff I uh, gave an example of earlier. Uh, while Yarn will cover the package management, so you will install things through Yarn rather than NPM, uh, and also the dependency hoisting, so you can keep all your node modules up in that one node module folder in your monorepo, and keeping your or project uh, directories fresh with just like links back to the hoisted node modules. So. I just want to give a quick, like an honorable mention to here. We don't use it at, at ACAST, but I'd say if I were to go back, uh-huh, that was not where I was going, thank you. Of course, there are some issues here. Um, this is not, it's not, it's not helping me here. Remote presentations, there we go. Uh, if I were to use, like start a repo, a TypeScript repo today uh, with mostly apps uh, that I intend, I think it will need to scale a bit. Like I'm planning to add a lot of apps to this. I would probably consider using Nar, Nar, Narwhal, Nar, I didn't really figure out the name until I saw the logo, Narwhal, uh, Narwhal NX. So it has more proper monorepo capabilities compared to Lerna. Lerna is more about like solving the dependency issues, uh, Lerna and Yarn. While Narwhal has more things like the proper dependency graphs and uh, you can, you know, the ownership controls that I mentioned separate a lot of stuff. It respects code owners and stuff like that in a different way. And it, I would say based on what I've tried, I haven't had the time to really check how well it scales, but from what I've read, uh, it seems to be a better contender when it comes to like multiple larger apps in one one repo. Because it's true, Lerna can at one point be just not enough for your, for your needs. After, like you, you outgrow it after a certain uh, point. But yeah, that's just a quick honorable mention to, to Norwalk. Then we have some additions to this one repo that you're setting up. First one, and definitely a useful one, even if you're not using a monorepo, is Renovate. Renovate uh, basically, I can't, I'm trying to re remember the, the other, like Greenkeeper and Dependabots are some other uh, examples. It basically makes sure that your dependencies are up to date and works super well with monorepos, both Lerna and Normal, and will make sure that the dependencies across the board are updated and can even like make sure that internal dependencies are correct and stuff. Um, fun fact, it's free now, but when it used to be priced per repository and you had like 50 repositories where you wanted to use this, going monorepo also was very cost efficient. Second up, specifically for Lerna, I don't think Nora will cover this, covers this, but conventional commits, once again, useful even if you're not using a monorepo um, with semantic release, uh, but Lerna supports uh, conventional change logs. So you can set up your commit semantics. Basically, you, if you don't know what, what conventional commits are, you uh, format your commit messages in a certain way so that they can be parsed and then included in an automatically generated change log of all the changes that have happened since the last release, basically just looking at the commits and then sort like ordering them by scope, which is super convenient because it saves you a lot of documentation and then like change log maintain, maintenance. Okay, general recommendations. These are super, not biased, but these are just from our experience. Uh, they might not be true in the future. They are maybe not, guaranteed to be the best but it's a good uh, th this is what i would do if if we were if i were to do this right now so like i said yarn workspaces we want to use the same hoisted dependencies 
for the apps in their packages. Oop, I crowded the street down here. Um, so this means that we don't like just hoisting, that's also good. But if we keep the same versions, we will, when we bundle our packages together, we will, can make sure that the actual versions being used uh, and the, the files being used are the exact same ones by both our packages uh, and our, uh, our apps, reducing the bundle size a lot. Once again, you can do this with a, uh, with a multi-repo, but it saves you a lot of time and uh, it, it's easy to maintain and make sure that all the versions are the same throughout the, the repository. Especially useful for front-end apps since it reduces the bundle size. For a back-end app, maybe you don't care. Testing dependence. Going back to the regression testing that I mentioned, it's actually not like uh, included out of the box, or it is as a command, but uh, I think people tend to forget it. But when you do changes to packages downstream, as in your downstream, your, your packages that other projects depend on, you want to make sure that you always test any dependence. This is something I found myself skipping or, or at least forgetting to do when making changes uh, for you know, packages in their own repository and just trust that they read the change log and uh, won't update if there's a break in change or whatever. In the monorepo case, we can just make sure that when we make that change in our package, it works in all the, uh, the dependence as well, or it breaks and we know that, yeah, we should probably not commit or maybe commit, but maybe not push this until we know that it will work in the, in the dependence as well. Concurrency limits. This is a thing for a lot of different applications and, and tools. Uh, like when you run your tests, say you use suggest and you use the max worker stuff there. But since we are doing a lot of changes across the board throughout our monorepo, maybe we do, oh, I want to test the monorepo, as in I want to test every single thing, every single project that we have at the same time, that we just can't do that up to, like up to a point where our computer will shut down. Uh, so you can't do unlimited concurrency. And it's also very slow to do sequential updates or sequential um, run the commands, say tests or builds in sequence. So you, I, I'd suggest experimenting a bit with the concurrency limits. It depends on your hardware. The, from my very scientific test on, in the picture there, uh, where I tested it on my MacBook and also there's another one for like RCI servers. And um, there's, you can reach sort of a sweet spot between your concurrency limits uh, depending on your on your hardware that makes a significant impact on your, the time spent running commands like building and testing. And I guess sort of finally, or as a recap, I want to go back to, it is a monorepo, it is not a monolith. When the monorepo, there's, there's a fine line definitely, because as soon as you start importing something relative to your the, the location of your code, then the monorepo might end up becoming a monolith in the sense that it's only a monorepo as long as the, 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 the projects within it are isolated. They're contained and can be extracted at any point without breaking, uh, breaking their functionality, which means that essentially every re repository, like smaller project within the monorepo could be made into its own repository and still work. So really, when you go from a multi-repo to a monorepo, there shouldn't be that many changes. You should see a difference in maybe how much you decide to extract because it's more convenient. You should not end up doing writing your code differently or setting up your scripts differently. You should really not have anything pointing outside of the project at all because at that point, you're not using a monorepo, you're using a monolith with, that is just clumping a bunch of code together in one big repository. And that's not what we want here. Which kind of summarizes what I wanted to show here. And I think I made the time, I made some last minute changes and I was worried about the time, but uh, 40 minutes should be fine. 
so thank you for listening. I think if you're still there, I can't hear anything. Uh, but I think this is time for questions. I'm not sure how this works, actually. This is my first time with Stockholm.js. Hi. Thank Hi. you so much. That was really interesting. Yes, there are people here. We are still here. We are, uh, we're still listening. Yeah. Uh, thank you so much. That was really interesting. Um, and uh, yeah, it's time for questions. So if anyone's got any questions, then they should write it in the Q&A or in the um, or in the chat. I don't really mind. I can see both of them. Um, so uh, yeah, let's uh, let's start. Um, so uh, somebody who would like to remain anonymous uh, would like to know uh, to deploy projects I, independently inside. Sorry, Toronto sorry. Repo. I think you cut out a bit, so I, I didn't catch oh, the beginning of the question. Yeah. Okay. Uh, okay. Can you hear me now? Yes. This is yep. the joy of virtual. <laughs> yeah. Okay. So uh, <laughs> how would you handle deployments uh, if you want to deploy a project independently inside a Monarch repo? Right. So this is a pretty common question. Uh, am I, I, I think I'm understanding it correctly when you mean that you actually, maybe I <laughs> like it to ask for like a clarification. Do you mean releasing one thing at a time, just that project? Or do you mean when you want, say you're updating a package uh, to a new version and you only want that new version in one of your apps? Uh, and you don't want all the dependents to be updated. I'm realizing it's all hard to yeah. ask questions back here, <laughs> but I'm going to answer yeah, both. Yeah, <laughs> so, both. So, yeah, that's good. so the first one is uh, quite simple. You can filter your deployments or uh, publishing uh, in your CI or manually at your computer and only deploy the things, uh, the, the projects you want. I keep saying things, projects, packages, just so many terms. Um, so that shouldn't really be an issue with a monorepo. The second part is, I'd say, an issue. You can go around it by locking versions, same as you would do when you want to, uh, you know, I don't want to update uh, this dependency that I use, so I'll just leave it with this version. That works in a monorepo, but you're gonna get issues down the line when, because the, you, you won't be able to develop, basically, you won't be able to use it the, the, uh, the way you, for the reason you set it up in the first place and that you can have your, um, like you make your, your, your changes and they're instantly reflected in the app that it's linked to. Mm -hmm. So I'd say it's more of, uh, it's definitely not recommended when you're working with a monorepo and it might take some time changing that. Maybe you should consider why you don't want your updates to be reflected throughout your apps rather than uh, in just some of them. Okay. Okay, cool. But it's a good okay. question and probably the most common one that pops up. Okay. Okay, cool. Uh, so next question. Uh, can you move all your current repositories to one mono repo and still keep the commit history? Uh, yes, but it looks horrible. <laughs> <laughs> uh, you, you, you can, you can, there are ways around this. You can do some Git magic. Uh, you can even do it the other way around in that you can scope your commits to only get the, the changed files. Uh, from your monorepo when you extract it to a separate repo. Uh, I'm saying that you can without ever having done it myself because <laughs> trying it out the first time just looked like shit. So we we let yeah. the, we kept the archive of the initial mono, uh, initial repo and then mm -hmm. went with a fresh start for the monorepo. Mm -hmm. But you can. That was, I mean, you, that was the question. Yes. Yeah. Yes. <laughs> you can. So, yeah. You can do it. So if you if you if you care about the commit history from all the repositories, you can merge them together into one. Okay, great, great. I really okay. hope I'm right on this one, to be honest. Yeah. <laughs> Someone's going to try it and then message you and yeah. go, no, you can't. Uh, yeah. Okay, okay, cool. That's, uh, that's all the questions that we have at uh, the moment. Um, okay. If, uh, if, yeah, if people want to ask you more questions, they can get in touch. Is that, it was the best way to kind of get in touch with you? Do you have Twitter or uh, LinkedIn I, or something like that? I'm more of a Twitter lurker than I am a poster. Fair enough, uh, yeah. But I suggest... Uh, maybe an email to, to begin with before yeah. I'm more modern than that. <laughs> and, uh, so should I write it down maybe in the chat? Maybe yeah, you can put start. it in the chat. Yeah. In the, yeah. yeah, we can do that in the, in the break time. So we're going to have a little bit of a break now, but thank you again, Daniel. That was really, really interesting. I really enjoyed it. And, Great. uh, yeah. 
we're going to take a little bit of a break now. Uh, so five minutes, we'll come back at, uh, at uh, seven o'clock. Yes, seven o'clock. Um, the time has just flown by. Um, and, uh, and yeah, we'll have the second talk from Anton. So uh, yeah, see you in five minutes. Thank you. Okay, we're back. Can people still hear me? I changed my earphones, so it's a bit, I don't know. Perfect, thank you. Instant feedback, that is what I want. Okay, 
So uh, yeah, we're back. I hope you got a nice drink uh, or, you know, a cup of tea or something like that. And you're ready for the next talk. Uh, Anton, are you there? Oh, I am here. Excellent, excellent. Like I was very worried that you'd gone for a beer as well, but uh, <laughs> I no, have, I'm... but it's uh, it's, oh, okay, it's already better. here. Yeah. <laughs> Fantastic. <laughs> okay, um, so uh, yeah, um, I'm going to pass over to you, and uh, yeah, you're going to talk to us about more programming. Yes, let's see. Take it away. I can share my screen then. There we go, and. There we go. All right, do you see this? Yes. Perfect. So, this is Woody Sul. I'm not exactly sure how to pronounce his last name, but I think it's something like that. In 2012, he was hired to help a team that was like battling some big, nasty projects. And his job was to make them basically become productive. And the first thing he did was to pause these projects and instead focus on learning the team or teaching the team about like clean code, code smells, design patterns, everything like around it, like refactorings and everything related to that. Uh, one thing he did was that he held a retrospective every day. Uh, they held a weekly practice session. And this weekly practice session was set up in coding dojo style. That basically means that one person is the driver who types on the keyboard, one person is the navigator who tells the driver what to write, and then you have a number of observers who does nothing, basically. And then you rotate who does what every time, and you solve like very simple uh, programming problems. So when they've done this for quite some time, uh, and they feel like confident that, all right, now it's time to like, resurrect these big nasty projects. Uh, they do it and start working on them and one developer in the team needs help uh, on a problem he's trying to solve. So what they do is they book a meeting room and they bring everyone in and start talking about the problem like how are we going to solve this. Uh, they like start talking about who's going to do what. Uh, one of them suggests like oh let's look at the code and see what's, what we can do. Uh, while doing this someone pointed out a code smell. Uh, and another person in the team decided, oh, let's fix it right away. And then suddenly they were all working on the same pro problem together and writing code uh, and doing it all together and at the same time. So my name is Anton. I am a consultant at a company called Empire Digital. I work mostly with JavaScript these days. I also done some .NET for most of my career, but I, I really like JavaScript these days. When I'm not working, I'm also writing code most of the time, or at least quite often. Uh, so I built some projects like a screaming new tab extension for Google Chrome, which is quite fine. I like building dumb things. Uh, I built a draw social drawing game now during the uh, corona pandemic that you can play a draw to fuck. I have a, a podcast. It's in Swedish, though, so if you don't know Swedish, that's a problem. But if you speak Swedish, you can listen on asdf.pizza. Uh, and that's not what we're going to talk about today, though. So we're going to talk about more programming. And some things we're going to talk about is what more programming is, why you should do it or why you shouldn't do it, maybe. Some challenges my team ran into because I was doing this full time for a year. And then how you can get started. I also added a little something about doing it remote. I haven't had that much experience with it, but I thought it was like relevant in these times. So let's start with what mob programming is. I, I usually, I've held this talk a couple of times before and I usually like, can you raise your hand if you've heard about mob programming before? This doesn't really work this time. But if someone has tried mob programming, maybe you can write it in the chat because I see the chat. Uh, and that would be kind of fun to know at least. Then I, I'll be more than interested to hear your experiences after it. So uh, let's start with this. So I see there's some people who have tried it. That's great. Uh, I'd love to hear if you have any experiences you want to share after this. 
So this is a quote from Woody again. He's been attributed like the inventor of mob programming because uh, he's written a lot about it and does, does, done a lot about like advocating for it. So he's, he says that all the brilliant people working on the same thing at the same time in the same place and on the same computer. That is what mob programming is. And if this doesn't tell you anything, it's you can imagine it's as pair programming, but taken to the extreme. So instead of being just two people, maybe you are three, four, five, six people, and you all sit at the same computer and uh, work on the same problem. So this is a picture from my uh, previous assignment where we were mob programming full time. And you can see that we have like one giant monitor. It's actually a TV, but we use it as a monitor. And you can see it, it's uh, kind of bad quality, but it's uh, the, the small monitor in the behind has like a timer on it. So how it worked was, the, we, we call this a mob station, just to have a fancy word for it. But how it worked was basically you had one driver, just as when you did like coding dojos or stuff like that. and then it kind of differs a bit on how you decide to do it. We had the, the setup that everyone uh, participated in the discussion. You could do it like the driver doesn't speak, um, which could be good sometimes. But uh, we had the setup that, all right, we, uh, the driver who types on the keyboard, uh, he can also, he or she can also like uh, participate in the discussion. And we ended up being usually three or four or five people when I started who, who did this at the same time. And then we used the timer that you see on the, on the small monitor to decide like whose turn is it now? When are we gonna change who uh, sits at the keyboard? And that's also like one thing that you can experiment a bit with, like how long do we wanna sit at the keyboard? So we ran eight minute uh, timers so every eight minutes we rotated who was at the keyboard, which worked quite well. Sometimes we actually lowered it to like six minutes, depending on what we worked on and like how tired we were for the day uh, or something like that. And we also like experimented with running like 12 minutes, but we decided that that was too much or too long. So another important thing is that everyone uh, has to be like involved in the discussion. So we, we actually, worked a lot with not just like how do we work with clean code for example we worked a lot with all right how do we feel do we dare to be vulnerable and and actually uh, say when we think something is wrong do we dare to say like hang on this is this is taking this is going too fast i'm not i'm not uh, keeping up with you uh, or i'm not understanding what we're doing or why are we doing this so that was one very important thing. And I'll get back to that uh, in a bit as well. Another thing, uh, what we did was that we actually pulled in people who weren't developers. So like product owners or uh, user experience designers or something like that. Like when we were doing something that they uh, were very involved in, like one feature that wasn't clearly defined, maybe we needed a product owner. Uh, we, we, it kind of varied if they sat at the keyboard or not. It was we we were quite up for it. Like it's no problem to like have someone sit at the keyboard even if they don't know how to program because everyone else does. Um, and the same thing with UX. But like uh, sometimes they decided to, like I'll just sit with you and and talk with you while you while you do it. And another thing that's also uh, like. This is this is a this is a small thing, but like one thing we did was that uh, we had one account to like for everything. So we had like one team account for the um, for the let's say for example the GitHub account was a team account, so everyone could log in uh, and everyone pushed from that account. There is benefits like pros and cons uh, with this. Like if you maybe want to see who who does what, uh, so you can get back to it. In our case, we, we resonated that it shouldn't matter who does what. And then we also got some pushback from like the, the business side of things that they want accountability and it has to be secure and stuff. But I, I really, really liked having uh, just one account. So uh, let's talk a bit about why. We'll get back to a bit about like technical stuff as well when we get to the challenges and stuff. Um, 
this is also uh, a big subject. Like it, it, for me, it's very much about creating a foundation to like create an environment that like encourage everyone to do great work and have like a shared understanding of what are we doing. Uh, I mean, I love writing code. Uh, it's definitely one of my favorite things to do, but our, our job as developers and especially as a consultant as I am, is not to write code technically, it's to solve problems or like provide business value, even if that sounds extremely boring. And that's what we're gonna, what we need to focus on. So I think mob programming is a great way to actually, uh, actually provide this value. So some more concrete, concrete examples of why we should do this. Uh, one is quality. Like there's a great uh, like short video that I should have included here that shows like a, a graph of how the quality of the code is. But you can imagine like if you are one person who uh, writes the code, you will have your up and downs. Like it's, uh, it's natural for everyone. You won't write the best code you do all the time. So that's what's gonna be published as well. And even if you have like code reviews, there is stuff that's gonna slip through. But when everyone sits together, you constantly talk about the code. You have uh, no, like you have live code reviews, which means that when you actually do this, people will discover what, uh, what problems the code has or what problems you are about to, to release or whatever. And that is fantastic. So instead of making sure that like I try to provide my best code, we make sure that the best of the team makes it into the code instead of like my varied contributions. We also break down the knowledge silos. Um, like even if it, we talk about like the domain that we work in, or if we talk about uh, like parts of the code that we feel ownership about, like when we work in a mob, we don't really have that. I mean, they're, they're, my, you might end up uh, with some of these, but you, the majority of them will disappear. So even if we talk about the domain or if we talk about even if, like some patterns or best practices, you, you break down these knowledge silos and educate the entire team constantly every time you do this. And it can be like something so small as like, oh, I learned a new shortcut in VS Code, for example, or whatever. And this leads us that, that you never get stuck. And, and I, I put never, <laughs> like never, but most of the time you won't get stuck because there will always be someone in the mob who has like an idea of like how you're gonna solve it. Or if you get like a, an error message or whatever, it's much easier to like stare yourself blindly on it when you're, so, when you're on your own like if, if you are multiple people looking at it, it's so much easier to like talk about it and then work out the, what the solution is. And like from my experience, I know that I've like sit with a problem for a long, long time before I actually like, ah, I ask someone else and they like, oh, it's super obvious. It's just this, you missed a semicolon, for example, or whatever. And this also means that like we spend more time actually writing code instead of being stuck. And then we spend more time providing value instead of uh, like being stuck on things that we uh, like normally solve. But as you all probably know, you get stuck on silly things sometime. Another thing is that we remove a lot of overhead. And that me with overhead, I mean like, uh, for example, code reviews that I mentioned earlier, we didn't do code reviews at all at my previous uh, place when we did more programming since we were at least three, four people working on the same thing. The code review was live. So we removed that. We had a lot less meeting than I, than I was used to. Uh, I hadn't been doing this. Like I started doing it about a year ago and did it like for a year. Uh, and before that I had a lot of meetings and when doing more programming, that didn't really happen. I mean, we, we did have like a daily stand up. Uh, or daily sync just to uh, make sure that our product owners and people like outside or a bit outside the team um, were up to speed. But for, we didn't really care about the, that uh, sync because we were really up, up to speed already with what we were doing. Uh, 
And you, you can't also forget that it's, I think it's a lot of fun. I mean, this is very much each to their own, but for me, it's so, so much fun to talk about code and talk about how we're gonna solve this and what is, what is the best solution for this. Uh, and this is one way of working that I've found that I've had the most fun at work, so to speak. So now all of you are of course thinking this is like the best thing since sliced bread, but uh, of course it's not. Um, so let's talk a bit about challenges. And one we had a lot of problems with, I'd say, was scaling the team. When I started, we were, I think we were five developers. Uh, and then everyone usually sat in like one mob. So we were all five people at one computer. Uh, and this worked so, so well, because that meant that, like I talked about earlier, like we had no knowledge silos, we could, everyone was constantly up to speed with what we were doing. There was like no problem at all uh, doing this. Then more people joined because we had to like scale up the team and like produce more, of course, uh, even though maybe we resisted it, but uh, considering the time frame that had to be done. So what happened was we brought in some more people and we decided to split so that we ran two mobs, so two groups of people working on two computers. So we set up another mob station with another like big screen, another small screen beside it, and uh, just a keyboard and mouse. And it worked all right, uh, I'd say. Um, the problems that started to arise is that you, you, uh, you get less of the benefits that you get when you do mob programming when you have to uh, like scale it up. Like the optimal way to mob program, I'd say, is that the entire team does it. And that maybe that doesn't work if you are 15 people, but it can work if, for your, if you are up to like, I mean, doing it with 10 people can work, maybe not doing it full time, but like doing it for certain issues. Uh, and we eventually scaled up so that we had three mobs. We were nine developers at the end. And that also like meant that it brought up a lot of these issues to the surface. Like we got more overhead since we had to like think, oh, like who, which mob is doing what today uh, compared to earlier when we asked, all right, we are going to do the next thing. That's always going to be, there's always going to be like a next thing. Uh, there were more communication challenges. It started to be some knowledge silos because one mob was maybe working with this feature for a long time. And when there was a, uh, we had to do like a bug fix or another thing in that uh, area, it was very easy to like, oh, but you, you, you guys or you people did it before. So you can, uh, you can take that. Uh, we tried to do this, uh, like we tried to negate most of it, like trying to rotate who sits in which mob and like, it was very open. Like if you wanted to like, oh, I want to change the people I work with today, then you did. And that was very fine. But like a lot of the benefits you got and that we've gotten when we were like just five people, uh, we still got some, we still got the benefit of one program, I'd say, but not just as much as before. So the second challenge, uh, that's, it, it is a challenge, but it's also a good thing. And this is regardless of you, if you mob program or not, I'd say. And that is like, when you mob program, you have to be vulnerable. Uh, it's, it's impossible to, to mob program if you don't dare to be vulnerable. It's, I think it's good in every single team, but mob programming, I think mob programming is extra, um, it's, it's um, extra like risky in a mob programming team if you, if you don't dare to like open up. So you, you have to like be brave enough to say like, I don't understand, or can we talk this through again? Or sorry, this is going too fast. Or like I mentioned in the beginning. And there is like uh, science behind this as well. Like there is uh, like Google, I think did a huge, huge like uh, science study a few years back that uh, showed that like the, the teams that performed the best were the ones that was vulnerable which is with each other um and i can also recommend like reading some of Brene brown's 
things. Uh, she has written a lot of books about like exactly this. She's also a scientist who's researched this. Uh, she also has a, a Netflix special that's called Call, Call to Courage that I also really, really recommend. Um, but like I said, it is it is extremely tough to like, especially when you come in as a new person in the team and everyone is like going really fast and they know where in the code you're going to and like, oh, this is this is what we're doing and this must be this issue and stuff like that. It's it's very tough to like raise your hand and like, so, so, sorry, I don't. I don't understand. Can we slow down, please? Um, but the, I think that's, for me personally, that's the most important thing you can learn if, as a developer or as a person in life to be vulnerable. I'm, I'm really, really sold on this, as you might hear. But uh, if you want to talk about just vulnerability, I'm also really, really up for it. But moving on. So, uh, maybe a lot of you is also thinking like this can't be productive um, and that's I think that's the most common question like were you really productive were, was, weren't you writing like more lines of code when you if you were nine developers working on nine computers and I'd say yes we would write more lines of code but we have to change how we talk about productivity productivity isn't the number of lines of codes we produce it's the the quality of the code is that better than than if we were nine people it's uh, is it like fewer bugs do we take care of our technical depth better when we do this as a mob it's it's like productivity is so so uh, broad but it's very easy to focus on like how many features we we produce or how many lines of code we produce and that isn't productivity for me so, so I think you just have to shift how you talk about productivity. Then we have pol politics. That's also uh, one uh, like issue that also comes up a lot. Like the question is, how do we actually convince our uh, like team lead to, to, to let us try this or someone who, who decides how we're going to work? And uh, yes, it's, it's hard uh, to get like buy-in from people in power, but you should try to maybe you don't have to like go all right let's now we're going to mob program full time for a year as a test or as an experiment that isn't uh, i don't think that's a good way to start it uh, i think it's better to like uh, start small and then scale it up if it works well and maybe this talk has given you some pointers like what you can bring up for benefits uh, to more programming as well but this also leads us into like how you get started uh, if you want to try it out try it, try it out so here are a few tips uh, i think these are the three most important ones it has to be a team effort so like everyone in the team needs to be on board at least to try it out you don't have to be like entirely sold on the idea of mob programming, but you have to at least be uh, on board with the idea of trying it. Because if someone isn't, then it's, it, it won't be like uh, a good environment in the mob when you're doing it. If someone is like, oh, I don't, I don't, I don't want to do this. Why are we even doing this? That's uh, not going to work. So everyone has to do, give it like a genuine effort to at least try it. So another one is to don't go all in which I touched upon just now. So instead of going all in, start small, like try it out on a single task. Try it out to like, uh, oh, we have this difficult feature or this difficult bug. All right, let's grab three people, four people, put them together and then try it out. And this is all the thing, you don't have to like bring in this huge TV to use as a screen and have an extra screen beside it. Just use your phone for the timer, um, pull two desks together and use a meeting room with a projector in it, for example, to have a big screen. Um, one thing that I didn't mention before, but is extra like uh, relevant in these times is use a hand sanitizer. Uh, We've been, we, I've used hand sanitizer for a year, so I'm kind of used to these times now. But it's, it's a really good thing to have, like just to avoid uh, people getting sick, especially now. And then experiment. Like you don't have to do it as I've said. 
you don't have to uh, do the rotation at all if you don't want to. You can say like, all right, uh, I'm gonna write. The, I'm gonna write. You guys sit behind me, and and we're talking about it. Uh, you can change the rotation to be once per hour if that works. You can like do whatever works. It's basically what I'm trying to say. Uh, and then try different th things that if, if it doesn't work the first, first time, that doesn't really mean that mob programming isn't for you. It mostly means that, yeah, maybe we haven't found the right way to do it. One last thing, I said I had three things, but uh, another way to try this out is the mob programming RPG. Um, it's, uh, it's basically like a game where you you bring people together, put them in a room, you have one computer and you have like a programming uh, exercise. I've, I've done this and I've used Fizzbuzz uh, that a lot of people know. Uh, and then people get assigned different roles. Like you get assigned to driver and navigator, but also like archiver who can write down your decisions. Or I think someone is visualizer that is uh, how like take a problem or an, something you discuss and visualize it on a whiteboard, for example. Uh, and it's and then you get like experience points and you level up and it's it's actually a lot of fun. I ran it with my uh, previous team that was experienced with more programming and they also thought it was really really fun. Um, so that's one way to try it out if you don't like wanna uh, jump into a real thing. And this is also great for like team building exercise because this is like really, I think the Fizzbuzz thing is, it, it's quite simple. I mean, most people know what, how to solve it because you've seen it before, which in my entire team had done, but it took them almost 45 minutes to do it. Like when they were doing this, just because they were like focusing on doing all the right things in the game. So uh, I added this as well, remote mob programming. I don't have much to say. Uh, I did it for three weeks, I think, or something like that, uh, three or four weeks. So we didn't really get into like the, the jive of it. Um, but uh, what, we, what I did like uh, see during that time was that like there is some things you can do to make it easier. Uh, one thing is to run everyone remote. We had a few times before the pandemic when we were like three people at the office and one person who was working from home who was in the same mob. I'd say that didn't work at all because it was like so much, uh, like the communication got so like weird when people were talking to each other on, on the spot and that one was at home. And yeah, I, I'd say it didn't work. So if you're going to do it, everyone has to be remote. Um, always have your camera on. The, uh, for me, it, it feels a bit weird in the beginning, but uh, as soon as you do it and get used to it, it helped so, so much because communication isn't just like the voice. It's just as much like how you look and it's so easy to see if someone is distracted, especially now when you're working from home, like if you have kids at home, it's so easy to see like, oh, th there's a kid, he's a bit distracted, so I'm not going to disturb him right now. Uh, and it, it just helps so, so much. Uh, there's also some like uh, screen sharing tools that you can use. We were using VS Code Live Share. Uh, that is like, you still code on your own computer, but it's, it's basically Google Docs for programming, uh, I'd say. And that uh, worked fine. Uh, it, there was a bit of an issue. There's, the, the good thing is you can also like share ports, which makes you uh, able to actually access the whatever you're developing on your own computer. But we actually ended up using Microsoft Teams. I'm not a big fan of Microsoft Teams, but their uh, like screen sharing worked really, really well. Uh, you can also have multiple people controlling the computer at the same time, which means you can point at stuff with your cursor and everything like that. And it makes it also really, really easy to rotate when you're mob programming. So that's uh, one thing that's really, really good. Another thing is that we ran a lot longer intervals before rotating uh, than we did. Like I said, we used like six to eight minutes before. When we did this remote, we were up to like 15, 20 minutes, uh, just because that uh, there is a lot of more context switching going on when you're doing this remote. Maybe this was because we were unused to it and maybe we could have worked it down to our normal time. 
but uh, that what was what worked for us at least. So, to summarize, Bob programming for me is a great way of working. I think it's really, really fun. It helps me. I, I can say that I wrote the, the best code of my life during this year, and not only because I'm getting older and wiser, but but uh, definitely because I got like the constant the feedback loop for my programming was so 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 short that I learned so much. Uh, more programming optimizes for like quality, knowledge sharing, and removing the overhead, but it's not a silver bullet. So it's very possible that your team shouldn't do more programming. Maybe it doesn't fit your like way of working. And basically it works for my team. It works for a lot of other teams. There's a lot of information on YouTube. There's a lot of talks about more programming if you are more uh, curious about it. But with that, uh, thank you. And then I have some questions if you have any. Maybe Becky will pop in and so Here I am. Hello. Here I am. Hi. Let's see if Hi. I can stop screen sharing. Thank you for that. Um, very interesting. I, I've I've heard of uh, um, people talked about more programming before, but I've always been a little bit skeptical. But it was nice to kind of, yeah, to hear more about it. And I think it's more. I was more skeptical about more about the vulnerability. I think mm -hmm. and having different kind of levels of people in your team. So I think, like from my perspective, like when you were doing the mob programming uh, initially with the kind of five of you and then as you grew, did you have people at different levels and how did that work? And kind of you have a junior and a senior developer or how did that work with the dynamic with that? Yeah, yeah, I totally agree. There is, it is very scary. I mean, I'm, I'm not super senior. I've worked for three, four years soon or something like that. Mm -hmm. uh, so when I started, I had worked for three years basically. Uh, and it was kind of scary like my team consisted of very varied like someone had worked for like 15 years and some had worked for something like me so that's it was a challenge but the, the team i sat in was very very good at this like mm. everyone had very very much bought into the idea of more programming which meant that we had like a lot of exercises in like team uh, team spirit and how we work together. We didn't just have like retrospectives and whatever mm -hmm. you have when you work agile nowadays. Yeah. But but we also had like a lot of uh, vulnerability exercises, for example. Um, okay. So that was okay, cool. really really good. Yeah. Okay. And and on a similar the one of the questions that's come in is on a very similar note, which is uh, my experience with mob programming is that only a few people talk um, and many others are, are just quiet, usually the junior developers and the new people in the team. Is there a way to get around this? Yeah, I think, I think the, the answer is very similar. Um, mm. Like you have to work on the team. There is definitely people who won't get used to it, like who, who won't get it. Uh, yeah. And that now I'm not, not talking about the people who, who doesn't talk, I'm more talking about the people who talks too much. Uh, <laughs> and then uh, it's really hard because uh, mm. then you basically have to say it uh, and mm. then you have to be extra vulnerable and like you talk too much or whatever. Mm -hmm. But and I think it's very, very important to be when you do more programming to be very receptive to like minorities, for example, who's mm -hmm. traditionally like in in programming nowadays at least it's very easy for like me i'm i'm extremely like stereotype of a white man mm -hmm. uh, so you have to like make sure that the entire team is with you and like work on these issues and i mean mm -hmm. that that's not only for more programming but it's extra important in more yeah. programming since you like do it uh, so closely together mm -hmm. okay. if that was an answer to the question yeah. i hope so no that's good um, okay, and uh, Eric wants to know, how would you approach mob slash pair programming when you're not doing it full time? Um, I'm the only developer in my company, but I could possibly do pair programming with more design orientated consultants now and then. Yeah, um, I think find the issues that you think fit for this way of working. Like you don't have to do it all the time. Uh, it's, I think it's a great uh, thing to do. Like if you find an issue that you find like, oh, maybe this needs a lot of discussion, 
traditionally you do like all right you write a comment in a year ticket you send it back and then you get the answer back and you do it again and then eventually get to some kind of consensus sometimes it might be a better idea to bring in that person put them ne next to you and write the code while they're sitting there mm -hmm. it it might be a problem to like convince them that this is a effective way of doing things because they think that they have better things to do with their time yeah uh, which they might have but <laughs> uh but it's it's always like a, you have to weigh your options, so to speak. Yeah. Uh, yeah. So I think like try to find uh, some task that you think could fit and then do it for just that task. Yeah. Uh, and you could also like, you, you can trick people. I mean, it's, it's, you can like say, oh, could you just come over here and we talk about it? And then you, mm -hmm. they sit next to you and you start writing the code and then you like, oh, so you mean like this and you write some code. And then yeah. they're like, yeah, I mean like that. And then you're like, oh, so this is, this is how you should do it. And suddenly you're doing it, but they don't really know it. Yeah. Okay. Okay, cool. Um, another question. Um, how would you handle uh, when one or more colleague basically says they don't like more, more programming? Um, I've found, because I, I'm, I'm one of those people that just goes, I don't, I don't think this is a good <laughs> idea, but listening to you, it's more about, you need to kind of be open to it. So how would you kind of approach kind of, uh, yeah, if a colleague is, uh, um, uh, says they don't want to do, or they don't like more programming, how would you approach that? Yeah, mm, send them this talk maybe. Uh, <laughs> no, but um, I think it kind of depends on why they're not interested. Because mm. um, it, it could be, like someone who uh, is open to the idea but is kind of afraid to do it because mm. uh, they're like but why why should i do it i i i don't want people seeing my code as i write it yeah. uh, which is a totally legitimate like thing but then you have to like assure them that that's not the we're, we're not in the mob to judge each other, each other. Yeah. like there's there's uh, just as much as a contribution to be in the mob and learning as it is to like providing what code to write mm -hmm. because if you're in the in sit in the mob and you are learning stuff then you are contributing because if you weren't there maybe you should learn stuff but you probably learn it much slower i'd say yeah so i think the answer to the question is find why they're not open mm -hmm. to it uh, and try to address that issue mm -hmm. i mean I, you you won't be able to convince everyone that's just yeah. how it is but uh, i'd say like finding the issue like why don't you want to try it really helps with convincing them as well okay okay great great that was the the last question so uh I, i'm going to ask you the same question if, if people have questions later on or uh want to get in touch with you somehow how would they get in touch with you yeah, uh, I'm uh, modern, like uh, Daniel said he wasn't. So I'm on Twitter. Uh, so yeah. if you want to uh, ask me anything, I, you can ping me there. Uh, I can post it in the chat as well right yeah. after this. Great. Um, great. Fantastic. That's uh, okay, great. great. Thank you so much. That was really yeah. great. And, uh, thank and you thank you. Me. Yeah, no worries. And thank you all for coming. And thank you for ACAST for also kind of co hosting this again today. Um, and yeah, enjoy for the rest of your evening. I think the sun is still sort of shining so you can kind of go I, I think so today. at least I'm extremely yeah, blinded yeah, by yeah. it. <laughs> so yeah, uh, have a good evening and uh, yeah, see you all again soon. Bye all. Bye. <laughs>